Well, this is going to be an easy thing tonight because easy. obviously it's obvious. And I got a couple of requests just to skip it because it's so obvious. But I thought we'd just go through the obvious tonight since it's obviously obvious to everyone that it's obvious. <laughs> obviously. Obviously. <laughs> That's his point. It's all obvious. Are there any more of these? Are there any more what? Any more of uh, the copies on first principle copies? Yes. I, uh, you only have to get a couple. Are you asking for another copy? Yeah. Uh, well, we have a new guest tonight, Alex, and he doesn't have a copy. So I don't know. Uh, any extra copies anyone have? <whistles> no? He can look over your left yeah, shoulder. Yeah, definitely. You're a leftist, aren't you? My right shoulder. You're a rightist? Okay. Just uh, want to make sure which shoulder to look over. <laughs> Okay, let's try it. All right. Is there anything here that you want to stop and talk about? And we left off at uh, number seven, which in our text is page 21. All right. I'm looking for a couple of good questions, uh, or we just jump in. Um, it's going to come down to what's the difference between nothing and what he's talking about when he uses the word that. I think he's got a, a high point on 23, if you care to uh, try it. Um, for when we imagine that we comprehend it that which we actually do comprehend is nothing to us. So completely does it transcend our conceptions. How then can it be shown how great an ignorance of that subsists in us? For how can we say that it is unknown? In one word, 
It is because we are forever finding that more venerable which is beyond our knowledge. So that if we could discover that which is beyond all knowledge, that very thing would be found to be most worthy of honor. That's, his, that's where he is. In one word, it is because we are forever finding that more venerable which is beyond our knowledge. Well, that's his claim. And he's saying, hey, we all, we all, we can all grasp this. We can all grasp this. Right? And the problem, the problem is uh, knowledge. See? What do we mean by this word? See, this is the whole question. See. Is it a three part? It's basically a three part, right? Whatever you know, you know that you know it. So there's always, therefore, the subject. Well, there's the process of getting to know something. And there's the object. No matter what kind of experience you have, if it has three, these three parts, you might say, there is a unity. But nonetheless, you're making clear distinctions. So what? Well, it means, therefore, there's always a difference. Right? There's always a difference. between the knower and the object of knowledge, or the subject and the object. It's always a difference. And if it's different, well, there's something about it you don't know. Well, in any case, it's not you. So it's always, uh, there's something that remains the same in you, and whatever you encounter is always other. Well, that's dual. That's dualism. That's a dualism. Right, that's a two, twofold. It's a twofold or a threefold, depending upon how much stress you want to put on the process of knowing. Then it's a trifold. But essentially, it's twofold. So therefore, if we're talking about the nature of the one, you can't say you know it. You, you, can say you go through a process to gain something because it's not a one. It's not a oneness. <coughs> it could be a oneness in respect to it being a unity, but clearly. A unity presupposes parts in a certain relationship. Does he not? This is very interesting for uh, knowledge, but you can't talk about the nature of the one. Because if you mean by one, one and only one, well, then it can't be a dualism.
strictly speaking, if you pull it apart, that's the first hypothesis of the Parmenides. This guy's very interesting. He says, you know what? If that is, if that is in any way, you know, if that, if that, if this is part of the hypothesis, and whatever that represents, then this is clearly all there is. <clears throat> all? He said there has to be something above that. We know it. That's the ineffable. All plural. This is part of a plural. This is all plural. Does you want to get really, do you want, want to really get down to what it's all about? Oh. Okay, now can we talk about it? Well, whatever you say about it, you're going to talk about it, you're going to have to say something about it, you're wrong. <laughs> Because you're going to be talking about it. But if you talk about it, you have to say something about it, right? Subject, object, verb, right? You got to say something about it. Go ahead, try. Now let's all jump on the person who does it, okay? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I'll show you how to do it. He says, I'll show you how to play. He says, right. Okay, let's hope someone comes in and talks about the one. First thing we'll say is, what are you talking about? <laughs> How can you talk about it? Doesn't it assume that there is something there? Well, there's nothing there. Because if there is something there, then it exists. But this is beyond existence, therefore whatever you say about it, you're wrong. Hi, what else do you want to say about it? When you... Pierre, how do you Jump avoid... In. How do you... Here's a problem I have, because how do you avoid leading the other person into nihilism when you're, when, you, when, you, when you're doing this argument? Oh, you say, how foolish, you're saying that nothing exists. <laughs> you really think there's nothing? <laughs> I mean, you're holding the idea of nihilism, aren't you? Play the game. Yeah, yeah, it's, there's, there's that, yeah. That, that transcendental one, no one can prove that it exists. Well, I'm sure glad of that because that's what we're talking about. <laughs> well, if it doesn't <laughs> exist, it, it doesn't exist. Obviously, it's beyond existence. Now, do you want to get, see, nihil, nihilism is going a step beyond that. It's saying nothing is. They're making an assertion. By the way, that's the ninth hypothesis. Right. Um, therefore, it's one among a bunch. Yeah. Pierre? Jump how in. That, how about that last sentence that Pierre uh, Louder, please. read? Page? Uh, page 23. That's a good one. Right, if there's a danger of considering this, uh, this dwelling upon the one, as a nihilistic tendency, what does this kind of language do uh, to dissuade from that? So that if we could discover that which is beyond all knowledge, that very thing would be found to be most worthy of honor. Yeah. Right? It's not, it's not just the destruction of all things. It's something that's most worthy of honor. <clears throat> and it's beyond See. knowledge. Say, knowledge is great. Wow, let me tell you about what's beyond it. Yeah. 
but someone could come back to Damascus and say, uh, why do you think it's honorable? Do you think it's an object of honor? Oh. I guess you're putting a, a halo on it, huh? <laughs> a, a crown. But there's nothing you can say that is, and therefore where would the halo fit? Somewhere above intellect. Um, see that quote, in one word, it is because we are forever finding that more venerable which is beyond our knowledge. Venerable. See, but you see, what's beyond all knowledge is the idea of the one. Well, first hypothesis. And what he's doing is he's using good old Parmenidean logic to show that even the idea of the one According to Parmenides, you can't even call it by a name, the one. That's illegitimate. So he's saying, in Plato's Parmenides, there is this idea of the ineffable. But he said, I want to really make it so strong that there's not even a possibility of you thinking that there is any relationship between the one and the ineffable. <laughs> Here. Jump in. I don't know, uh, the, this, uh, what you wrote under the first part of the hypotheses, are you talking about the second there? Well, let me read it and see whether it makes any sense. Uh, we're talking about the nature of the one, only one, and that's the first hypothesis, right. Right, which we can go through if you'd like. Uh, but the first hypothesis is part, is part of the hypotheses of the Parmenides. Oh, okay. Whatever the hypotheses represent, right. take them all together and you have all oh, there is. I see. Oh. See, by that, he's making the one part of an all. Plato would say, hey, that's cheating. But he wants to make it so clear that there's a ineffable that he criticizes as much as he can. Let's try another one. Look here. Um, with this guy, you can really turn to any page and pick up any sentence and read it. Like that. See, this is where he very clearly agrees with Plato on page twenty two. But in the case of that which in no respect and nowhere is, it's impossible, as Plato says, for any of the things which have being to be in any way present to it, nor in fact can non-being or privation be present, but only the total and utter impossibility of signifying its nature in any way. For if this is, and there is signification of things which are, even that which is believed to be is something, and even if it is believed not to be in any respect, yet the subject of the opinion is itself some one of the things which are. Therefore, Plato is right in calling that ineffable and beyond, right, and beyond the reach of opinion which nowhere and in no respect is, according to the worst, just as we speak of that as beyond opinion, according to the better. And he's got a feety footnote. 
for indeed we're forming opinions about that which is beyond opinion. And as he says, the argument is subverted. And in reality, we, in reality, we do not form any opinion. What then? <laughs> Shall we not think and be persuaded that these things are so? Or is it merely that we are affected in this way by that, as we have all uh, so often said? At any rate, we have in us this opinion, an empty one indeed, as befitting that which is void and infinite. As therefore we construct such opinions of things which are not, as if they were <laughs> of, of things which are, which are opinions, which are fantastic and fictitious. As when we believe the sun to be a foot in diameter, although it's not so in reality. So if we form any opinion, either about that which is nowhere and in no respect is, or about that about which we write these things, the opinion which we form is a vain one, even in our minds. For when we imagine that we comprehend it, that which we actually do comprehend is nothing to us, so completely does it transcend our conceptions. How then can it be shown how great an ignorance of that subsists in us? Or how can we say that it's unknown? All right, because if you say it is unknown, it, it exists for you. In one word, it is because we are forever finding that more venerable which is beyond our knowledge. So that if we could discover that which is beyond all knowledge, that very thing would be found to be most worthy of honor. Ah, but it suffices for the demonstration, firstly, that it cannot even be discovered by the second argument, it's beyond all things. <laughs> in so far it was in any way knowable, it would itself be one among all things. For we speak of the things which we know as all. And there would be thus be something common both to it and to other elements of the all, such as their knowability. Ah, but of things which have some principle in common, there is a single coordination, so that in this respect it would be among all things. But it's precisely in this that it should be unknown. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, What do you do with it? Or want to jump into any other quote before we take off? Hi. Well, just that last sentence, but it's precisely in this that it should be unknown. That is, that it, if it is knowable, that would make it among all of the things that are known, yeah. and therefore it would be a part of that multitude and not one. Yeah, right. that's right. Therefore the one must be unknown and not among beings. But it's foolish to think that it's unknown. <laughs> right, because you should not form any opinion of it. Because it'd be in that class of things that are unknowable. It'd be just another thing in the class of unknowable things. <laughs> right, but it cannot be in a class. This, this, this isn't even near if it is ineffable, so it depends on when it's ineff ineffable. Now that goes back to Carrie's point. What's the difference between the pure nihilism in this. Uh, would, perhaps, would a, what would happen to a nihilist if he said, I finally got an insight into nihilism, it's ineffable? <coughs> would he still be a nihilist? Mm -hmm. no. You know the distinction between the anarchist and the nihilist, right? The anarchist wants to burn everything down so that something new can emerge, and therefore he has a belief that things are possible to be changed, radical change <coughs> can only take place when everything currently is destroyed, and out of that the ashes will emerge something. And Elis says, you're wasting your match. <laughs> no. Why go through the effort of burning it down? Just showing you care. <clears throat> I 
or what's the difference between a nihilist and a pure Buddhist? Yeah. Good. You wanted to volunteer on that? Go ahead. Okay. I think it's an interesting question. Yeah, I try. That's yeah, I like it. Yeah, it is. Uh -huh. Because there's a there's a contemplative state where <coughs> ineffability is all is is already effing it. <laughs> you know, to call it ineffable, you've already named it. You've right. already committed a sin, Mount Vernon. That's right. <laughs> so when you're in a contemplative state, and something tremendously liberating and enlightening to the to the mind, it does a lot of good things to you. But if you're just walking down the street and <laughs> and uh, the same the same things you would say about the one, now finish it. Go the same things you would say about the one. You could also say about existence if you were a nihilist. That it, it, nothing, well. The same thing is the same thing. I don't understand that yeah, because I mean, you're talking about an I, I mean, talking about confused. something that exists. So just give it well, another shot. Try it again. You don't have to have it right the first it's time. It's the difference between the worthless and the priceless. Sure, that's right. Yeah. Only this guy is saying neither category fit. And so. Though it does make a point. That one is beyond all price. I think there's another way of arguing against this idea that, that we need to watch out for a nihilism with this kind of thought. Like when he says, for example, on page 23, for we speak of the things which we know as all. Mm -hmm. That tells me that there's an ascent to the one, right? Because that's a pretty lofty notion of knowledge, right? Like it encompasses everything. We speak of the things we know as all, right? So you got to get to that stage first, and then talk about that which is beyond the all, right? Yeah, yeah. That's what I was getting at with the, with the idea of a practice. That there's a state of mind to be in when when you're when you're talking about these things. I mean, usually people don't want to be around a know-it-all, but that's that is this system does have a know-it-all in it, <coughs> <coughs> but not in that bad sense. Essentially, all of the hypotheses in Plato deal with these two words. And um, the one and the others. And the, the, um, the first hypothesis is just the one. Second hypothesis is when you talk about the one and others, what can you say about the one itself. What are the consequences on the others if the one is such as you've described? Then you want to say, if in fact um, there are uh, others, You can talk about the others in themselves and in respect to others, assuming again that there is such a thing as one. And that clearly is the fourth. Then you can talk about the implications of the others upon the others given this condition, and that's the fifth. Right. And so you can represent it
and then you can go through the same thing, only say that the one does not exist in any way. Same, same development, same language, And uh, the one, of course, stands apart from all of this. And therefore, you have nine hypotheses. And uh, <coughs> when you're talking, therefore, about nihilism, then you're talking about if the one is not, nor are the others in any way existing, that's nihilism. So nihilism is the ninth hypothesis. What? Under what definition? When you say neither the one nor the others have any mode of existence whatsoever, that's nine. Uh, now, uh, Gina once memorized uh, the, uh, the first hypothesis, did you not? Along with others, yes. Pardon? Along with others, yes. Well, in the sense of these others here, or you didn't want to have that singular honor? Yes. <laughs> So long as it's with, with, with others, it's fine. It's fine. For if it were not with others, you would have to be standing there alone. Alone. <laughs> and therefore. Hung. Hung. <laughs> Hung. <laughs> yes. Here. Here. So, Damascus, yeah. I'll just let you know I have a copy of Parmenides here. Yeah, that's yeah. Well, I just I brought it tonight. I just well, that's worthy mistake, and, and and a good thing to do. Uh, yes, this this is a very interesting uh, uh, Oh, by the way, um, a cube has six sides, doesn't it? Would it be possible that um, if we look at this side and take that in consideration, would that then be In other words, we can get we can get six different sides that would represent these hypotheses and whatever they represent. Mm -hmm. What would that demonstrate? Anything or would that just be curious? So, I, so this is all three. And as you rotate this, right? You rotate it going this way, right? then three would move over, right? Mm -hmm. This is three, this is five. five. Facing it. And the back side clearly would be six, seven, eight, nine. Mm -hmm. All the denials. So the question would be, given Damascus, um, he's saying be careful about this. This, will, this, is, this adds a lot of confusion because, uh, strictly speaking, it only should, should be hinted at and then wash your mouth out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then he wants to give good reasons of why that's the case.
wonder what they would represent, the six sides. That presupposes, of course, that you wouldn't uh, make any changes in the position of these hypotheses to begin with, since it's already an ordered set here, second, third, fourth, fifth. Because if you read and get through to the heart par uh, the Parmenides, there is really a flow. Well, there's a flow. And therefore, if you move this on different sides, you're not going to get a flow. Therefore, the flowing procedure presupposes, of course, that the upper part The upper part deals with always the one, right? The one and others existing. The latter part deals with others. And therefore, there's a natural hierarchy as this is viewed. But, um, You see, it would then just spin around and the top would remain stationary and move around the bottom. You could also get that into different sets depending upon what it is you want to demonstrate. Um, hmm, oh no. I'm trying to get back into it. I would okay. like to add that in terms of nihilism. Uh, Which page are you on, please? 23. He has a sentence. Ah, that's a good page. I knew we're interested. So. He has a sentence here so that if we could discover that which is beyond all knowledge, that very thing would be found to be most worthy of honor. Uh, nihilism wouldn't consider it to be honorable. That would be a distinction. Yeah, but you have to no, you have to read the next sentence. Come on. But it suffices. <laughs> oh, but it suffices for the demonstration. Firstly, that it cannot even be discovered, and by a second argument, that it is beyond all things. So he just did what? Knocked out honor. No. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was noble. Yeah, That's so, so much for my nobility. And worthy of honor. Exalted. And worthy of honor. Yes. Yeah, but you see, the difficulty with that is... Um, but that would really be... <laughs> the difficulty with that is, does that mean there's, there has to be other things that are not honorable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever keeps us here. Yeah. Yeah. Louder? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, but according to this doctrine, if that's what is, then everything is... Honorable. honorable. Ineffable. And therefore, if everything is honorable, you don't need the term. Yeah, the here there distinction doesn't exist. Pardon? Well, because he said whatever keeps us here, yeah. right? If you're in that, if you're in that state of mind, there is no here or there. I mean, there is functionally, but I mean, it's well. That's why it's someone who's in that state <coughs> never trips. Never trips. <coughs> Because they're not anywhere, therefore they can't trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, I guess the, the biggest and the strangest question is, um, uh, where are we? Right? right, we're all said to be a person, are we not? <laughs> Even in Brooklyn? Okay. What is it and where is it that you're going to say you are? Go ahead. Where? Yeah, so we can point to it and declare it. They tell me I'm on planet Earth. Yeah, there you go. Good start. <laughs> <laughs> Southern California, <coughs> Orange County. Yeah, did you notice the boundary of yourself? Often. Oh, when you're in a mood or when you're not? <laughs> in a mood. When you're in a mood, there's always a boundary within which you live. Yes. When you're not in a mood, where's the boundary? Freedom. 
freedom, freedom thing. Then where are you? See, where's the, what's, where's, what is the self and where's the soul? He's going to say, you know what? Everything is ineffable. Every solitary, there is anything else. Therefore, it's not everything is ineffable. That's all. Now, go wash your mouth out. <laughs> or your soul. Hmm. So what would we say if, um, if someone burst through the door and they said, I've got, uh, you know, you guys are all foolish. I've got Damascus on first principles here. And, uh, you know, by his own admission, philosophy is, it's all, fo it's foolish. It's, it's in vain. Because you, what's the purpose then if what, if, if this well, is Well, the first thing you do is congratulate him on his insight. <laughs> Don't disagree. <huh? laughs> Let's say you can join us. You're one of us. Well, then you say, "Well, why would I want to join if philosophy is?" Uh... Oh, that's because you think there's something better. <laughs> Useless. <laughs> is that the idea? Dan? Right. You must think there's something better. Right. Why don't you bring it out and let us look at it? Because <laughs> we have our doubts about whether anything is better than. <laughs> the ineffable being nothing. Nothing means no boundary, see, no boundary, see. No boundary, no limitation. Mm -hmm. So what else might we say to this chap? Why don't you play him? Okay. Okay. Well, he says right here that it is, uh, that nothing can be said, so what's the point of talking about it? There isn't any. I'm glad you see that. Then why do philosophy? To let us know that uh, there's something beyond words. <laughs> to shut your mouth. No, so you don't have to go. That's that's negative. That's yeah. uh, interesting. Yeah, keep pushing it. Well. Why say anything if it should just be beyond and be adored in complete silence and mystical unknowing? You're absolutely right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so why? Here. <laughs> absolutely right. Now, why don't you do it? Yeah. <laughs> but, so what good could come out? What, what benefit could come from speaking? From oh, not being confused about the ineffable. How could that benefit you? Oh, because when there's no confusion, you are free of being confused. <laughs> That's a benefit. <laughs> and when you're free of being confused, there's no boundary. All right? Yeah, boundless. Yes. Taking all this together, is it fair to conclude that the ineffable is beyond mind? Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> For if it were in it, it wouldn't be ineffable. And if it's contained by something else, the container would be greater than what is contained. So, rather pleased that it's not in the mind. Does that not imply that, it, that the mind cannot relate to it in any way? Oh, they're so thoughtful. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's right. Sure Thank is. goodness. Because once you start relating to something, then you have to be relating to it. And it becomes an object of knowledge. Right, in certain ways of being and in certain ways of not being. And you're caught in all kinds of interesting situations. Therefore, so not only is it it's, it's unknowable, unintelligible, and you cannot relate to it in any way. This is, let's change one word. It's not that it's unintelligible. The idea of intelligibility doesn't grasp it. It's beyond it. Beyond it. 
rather than, yeah, see, rather than speak of it negatively as if it's something lacking. It's not in a category of unintelligibility. No, 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 no. Beyond it. No. Like no. beyond mind, beyond, beyond relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't have anything to say about it then. With that, if you're lucky. <laughs> you know, Pierre, but I there's... A, Pierre, I had a friend who told Good. me... I had a friend who said that she could have a, uh, an experience of this. What, do you, what, what would you call yeah, that? Yeah, we probably know the same guy. Okay, go ahead. Well, that's all. That's all. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Was that, is that possible? I don't know. Uh, pardon me. Do you think the person you heard it from was making it up? Uh, maybe. Could be. Sure. So the next time you see him, see whether you can find out whether he's a liar. <laughs> right. Now, don't ask me how. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, that's what he's doing. He's saying, look, get the guy to talk. Get the guy to talk and see whether he slips. And in any way attributes anything to this thing that you just described. And if so, we know he's not appreciating the language in its proper use, which is not to apply it unskillfully, but rather with a degree of skill and art, right? Yeah. Jump in, David. I got See? He's one of our good colleagues. Try it. Well, it would be, if, I, if it was to be taken in a higher sense. Yeah, you say, don't think much of it, please. It's ineffable. <laughs> but we do not agree the dude has written quite a big, thick book about this subject. <laughs> a lot of words. A lot of He's certainly not silent about it. And, and he really does write skillfully about it, too. I mean, there's a certain way that he has of using the words that communicates that he's experiencing his meditation on the one on a very high level, right? Like this, the first sentence on 20. Yeah, but he would correct you by saying that if you really don't call it an experience. That's yeah. making a distinction among other experiences. Right, but then how... That suggests you, it has some mode of being which you're experiencing. Yeah, I understand yeah, that. Yeah, but go ahead. But Just have fun. Would you, how would you uh, interpret then this word affected in the first sentence on 23? Or is it merely that we are affected in this way by that, as we have so often said? So that's what and I, by the way, I, I totally agree with it. The guy has got a, a, a very fine hand... Yeah. Um, like he's communicating samadhi in every line. <clears throat> so, by the way he starts it, that's what we're really talking about, isn't it? And, and uh, well, actually, six is, starts out better than seven. Uh, come then. Let us in the second place consider it in what manner it is said to be completely unknown. For this, or if this is true, how can we set in order all these predicates concerning it? Are we not indeed merely weaving words when we make foolish assertions about things which we do not know? For if it is in reality uncoordinated with all things and without habitude to all things, and no one thing of the all, nor even the one itself, <laughs> these very things constitute its nature, which we're describing as though we knew it, and are eagerly endeavoring to make other predications of it. So where what, page, what page was that? 17. 17. <clears throat> well, I don't 
But really, it's a, it's a really, I, for, I think it's a very, uh, uh, seven on page 21. Hey, you know what? As a consequence, we can form no true opinion of it, and that which we do form must be a vain one, for it's beyond all opinion. Cannot be discovered, it's beyond all things. So, the, the, see, what would happen if, if this became a way of, a way of being for a bunch of people? How would they then be different than those others? That's the issue, see, what, do, what difference is that? And would you not agree we should call on Barber? <laughs> uh, my colleague suggested that we call on Barber. Uh, I was just thinking that it depends on what your other group is, of course, but I, I think a lot of people in our society clutch their particularity to them, you know? Mm. And this would, you know, their, uh, mm -hmm. the way that they can be distinguished, that, that person that they say they are. They're in seek of that, in search of that person that they think they are. So if you ask people made this state of mind, this uh, ineffability mm -hmm, as a state mm -hmm, of mind, mm -hmm. and seeing the ineffability in everything, not seeing it in everything literally, but uh, making it a meditation, much like we made a meditation over one, one, at one seminar we went to, then it would seem like they're going the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. They would want to rid themselves of anything that would um, distinguish or make a difference. At least in a negative way, right? And I don't think there is a positive way. Is there? Well, I mean, Pierre certainly appears to us to consistently be Pierre, right? And the kind of information and the quality and impact that he has on people's lives distinguishes him as a person. But that's not a negative thing, I mean, right? I mean, I thought he was talking. I thought the questioning one, which I could be wrong, was how would those people that practice this as a meditation yeah. differ from other people? Indeed. And so I was answering with respect to myself, or, and so I don't quite catch the drift of your point, other than to say, thank you very much, Pierre. Yeah. Well, I don't know, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, just because you get into philosophy and start contemplating the first hypothesis of Parmenides and thinking in this way, doesn't mean that you cease to be a personality, right? An individual and coming across as one, right? It, are you, are you then clutching that to yourself? I guess, yeah, to, to a certain extent. And, and I, would also, I would also attribute it to all of us, really. I mean, the ego doesn't go away, right? It's just what is done with it. Are you there for making a last stand? I'm not making a last stand. Well, I'm, not, not, like I'm, trying, I'm trying He's to make, the flag of ego. Let's I'm trying it. to make a good point, actually. What point? I believe I've made it, right? I can't see the goodness of it. Okay, well, I thought you were going maybe to that's because you're being short-sighted. I don't know. I mean... Because I'm short-sighted? I said maybe that's because you're being short-sighted. I'm trying to be long-sighted. That's why I have glasses that okay. my vision. All right. But what... I guess I just saw I a problem with the criticism that it didn't, uh, for me, include uh, what I have perceived to be, you know, ongoing personality, characteristics of people that I admire, you know, including yourself. I mean, right? Ego doesn't have to be bad, per se. I I guess it depends on how tightly you clutch it to yourself. Like <laughs> it sounds like a limit, per se. Huh? In what way is it not a limit, Ingmar? Um, insofar as uh, good qualities can be communicated from a single person. Is that the way in which it is not a limit? Give me an example. I'd Pierre, like to see I already one. gave one. Have That's yourself. not a quality. Second. That's not a quality. Pierre is not a quality. Thank That's goodness. That's the point. He's not a quality. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think there are some qualities that could be distinguished. Frankness, keeping a lofty, uh, you know, a, a lofty vision of things, you know, consistently being able to be interesting. Right? How, how will we know when the question has been answered? Like, what's an answer? Remember like, what's an answer? Right. Right. Anything someone else? Are you talking about your Just in, in general, but specifically here, with the point that you're raising. Like, you're not satisfied with the answers. 
Really not. No, I'm sorry. How can we help, let us assume you're correct in your judgment, how can we help Ingmar see that there's something inadequate about the answer he's putting forth? Now, of course, the interesting thing is your answer may be perfect. Let's even assume her answer was really perfect. Hi, I understand your answer was perfect. Yes. Good. Then we have to figure out why a good answer doesn't settle your question and the issue. No, Thank you. In fact, quite the opposite. Raised up a, a firestorm of protest. What do you think of that? Uh, what do I think of what? <laughs> Let me make sure I don't assume I know what you're asking me. Uh, I, or no, I just said not only did it not answer Pierre's <laughs> question in your point of view, which it, it raised up a new uh, firestorm of protest to my answer. Hmm. Fact, do you think that's possible? Could that be said? That it was a firestorm? No. I don't know. <laughs> um, I at least, uh, yeah, I did see an inadequacy. In that. Okay. Then you, you, you were successful. But uh, I found it interesting well, what you I just raised, it. that it didn't answer Pierre's question, that that was my idea, too, that you hadn't answered that. Well, my, no, and my problem with your answer was your, that yours didn't seem to touch on his question. Oh, I would so love I to. I was quite completely I had baffled. An, yeah, I had an idea about that, too. Well, you know, you, you were to, I thought, criticize my answer to Pierre's question. But your answer, your criticism, didn't seem to touch on his question. That's, That's true. That's I mm -hmm. had a problem with. Oh, okay. So it's like... I, then to, to even deal with your comment takes me afield from Pierre's question. Oh, okay. Right? And so I, I really felt myself distracted in that respect. Because hmm. I wasn't interested in leaving the discussion, which I would have to do to answer your, <laughs> deal with your uh, objection. So, uh, so how would you return to that question then? No, I would, I would actually just say several things. One might be, do you see a flaw in my answer as an answer to Pierre's question? Perhaps. If so, if so, perhaps. If so, verbalize that. But secondly, if you have an answer that you want to give to Pierre's question, perhaps in your, in your very answer, I will see the lack in my own. And that might be an easier way to go all around. Um, well, then I'll take you up on your first suggestion. Um, uh, I think the second with is this far idea, more of a with challenge. With this idea of people clutching to themselves, uh, does it answer the question, what would be the difference if a group of people got into thinking this way? Yeah, because that's the other, other group. group. What's that? That's the other group. That's the other group. So I guess the lack would then be, how would how would these other people function? or how would through, their, through their ego. No, 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 no. Not, not them, but the, 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 the select group, the, the group that gets into it. Without their ego. Without there you go. <laughs> I like that. Well, no. as, Rob, as, as Brad said, he said they, they well, I, I'm taking it back to the conversation when Brad was saying, he was contrasting two ways. Sometimes he can feel a limit mm -hmm. to himself, right? He can feel, I don't know if you mm -hmm. call it, but maybe no. you call it yeah. a limit. A mood but sometimes has a limit. A mood mm -hmm. that has a limit. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he was free. Yes. And I took that free state to be the ineffable state or something in that class. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like then a person who uh, was functioning without, in this meditative group, would be that person functioning in that free group. Absolutely. So in terms of your second suggestion, uh, I immediately thought like the difference between uh, Plotinus that Thomas Taylor talks about and the common man who's concerned with um, you know, common things, doesn't think of the transcendental and can't be spoken of as a, a sublime and godlike man like Plotinus is. I mean, that, that's, there's just two totally different types of people. It seems that nobody in our society could fit this higher model except for this group, for example. <coughs> it's like, 
The answer to the question involves accounting for how the modern world's destroying itself. You know, and like we did, we're on a ship and we don't know where it's going to end up. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> so it seems like you've described the others imperfectly, but what about the class of those who meditate <coughs> on this notion? Sublime and godlike. And rare. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's curious that Thomas Taylor just selects just the few people to talk about in history. Damascus is right about the ineffable. Right. What follows from the psychological? Right. What's the impact of that? And then cosmologically, right. and theologically. Right. Like what's this, you know, what, we're, we're playing for a while. Now look, um, we're touching on um, the first one, which is the psychological. Okay. Let's say, okay, let's put that aside for a moment. Let's move to this one. I mean, the whole universe has been designed and made in such a way, or it has come to be in the way in which it has, in which the ineffable now becomes apparent. Now, what can you say about the universe? It's now the same issue, theologically. Right. What are the impact of that on theology? Because the idea of the one has often been called the dia negativa, the highest vision of God expressed in negatives. He's saying there's one higher, the ineffable. Okay, what impact does that have on this curious field of uh, the nature of the cause of that which is, beyond all causes, right? The highest of all. The ground of being, however you want to put it. What's the significance, again, of this idea of the ineffable in these three categories. Um, would a physicist come along and say, well, you know what? We're getting close to the Higgs bosom, right? The God particle, right? Getting close. That's what they're doing in CERN once they get that machine going. Bang, <laughs> bang they're going to hit that little guy, right? <laughs> it only lasts one trillionth of a second. Well, I think it's a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. Anyhow, right? They want to get to the nature of what is. You can't do it. Physically. Suppose they come back and they write their report. Ineffable. Wouldn't that be a gas? <laughs> So what are we going to do next time? Now look here. There's a lot in here. I was wondering about legally whether or not we can uh, uh, make copies of uh, 10 pages without anybody in the universe being so upset that we get a lawyer on our tailbone. Oh, the, well, they, no, the, well, they used to be, I thought, is there still, does anyone know? They used to be, for the purpose of study, you know, there was a certain percentage kind of we ought to ask Mark. What do you think? That's what I was trying to do. Uh, I don't know. Ooh, what is I don't know. Neither do I. Well, if it, re if it really is only 10 pages, if it really is only 10 pages, it's fair use. You can do it. It's cool. If it's like 10, yeah. yeah well, then let me, let, let me read a couple of them. Um, Got a lot of parts in here for the ineffable. The ineffable has a lot of parts. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just read the, the titles of them. Part one, the ineffable. The ascent 
to the first principle. The one in the knowledge of the one, procession from the one, the causality of the one, the intelligible triad on being as the unified, reversion, intelligible being, knowledge, six parts, the parts of the many, intellective procession. Ah, seven, summaries and comparisons. Chaldean theology on the intelligible cosmos, on, on substance, being life, intellect, the relationship between henads and the intelligible triad, all a whole bunch of stuff. Orphic theology. Any of these titles strike a bell? All of them. No, no, we can't, but 10 pages. Man. 10 pages. <laughs> what is that book? The Maces oh, on First Principles. Sir? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Karen? Sure. You were, you were going to. No, I'm just curious about what. Uh, I wasn't here. I used to. That's the guy, Damascus. Okay, cool. This is the new book. Okay. But, yeah. yeah. Pardon me? We were I'm just curious if we could order. Uh, the books, yeah, $90. I can get it for you two or three times the price. <laughs> <laughs> is she selling it for 90 uh, No, I think it's 80 or something, isn't it? Uh, I don't know. 100 or something. 100. She might be selling it for 90 I, I don't know. She had an hour, actually. Um, that guy's a neoplatonist. Okay, look, you know what's she interesting to do? Comparison. Pick one that seems so far out. The comparison to the Chaldean theology and the Orphic theology. <laughs> Who wants it? Raise your hands quick. We we'll go for that. Yeah, do it. How many people don't have hands? Raise your foot. <laughs> I'm, I'm Two for the Orphic theology. Well, the Chaldean oracles, of course, is said to be, according to Proclus, the very foundation of Platonic theology. All right, we should do both of them. Chaldean. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll make copies. Okay, I vote for the Barbara's one too. You mentioned the DNA negativity or the one. Yeah. I take it the first hypothesis, and then there's the ineffable beyond that. I thought that was the ineffable. I thought that was, you're not well, telling me. Well, I didn't understand your point. You said the negativity. What about it? And, and then there's the ineffable beyond that. <coughs> or beyond that, there's the in ineffable, yeah. Okay, is the first hypothesis considered the dia negativity? Would that be considered the... I think you've heard that said, have you not? Okay, then ineffable is beyond... That's what this dude is uh, <coughs> having what? a case for, isn't it? <laughs> well, I don't see anything that you can speak about in the first hypothesis. <laughs> you can't say anything about it. So how is that different than the ineffable? But you are talking about, you're talking about it, aren't you? <laughs> no, you, you're not talking about it. Well, what are you talking about when you talk about the one? That which it isn't. <coughs> but it isn't, that it belongs in the class of things that aren't. Uh, no, it doesn't do that either. That didn't answer that. that no, because it would that, give it yeah, the existence yeah, 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 of something yeah, yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. And it yeah. isn't. So you isn't have to come back either. with something in addition, don't you? But it, it doesn't. It doesn't have that existence of something else. Would you agree we have made the point, right, that he is admitting from the quote in, the, in his section that we have that there is a way of looking at the first hypothesis as being ineffable? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's right. Well, it sounds like what but he's But then he's going beyond that and saying still there's some lingering belief that there is something called the one. You're saying, not if you read it straight. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, it's interesting because it looks like he's focused on the very end of the first hypothesis, which is you can't, what can you say about it? And, that, and then he's expanding on that. Yes, that's what he did. <laughs> okay. No. That's cool. Fun. Thank you, guys. Yo Bong would love this stuff. <laughs> I was thinking Yo Bong would love this stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, they would go for it big time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In uh, Dogen. One of the uh, one of the problems 
they are translating is in, 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 in his Zen literature, his tradition. They'll talk about the dialogue between the master and the student. Mm -hmm. And when the student reaches a certain state of insight, they'll talk about the long, good silence. They'll call it the long, good silence. That's how I uh, hope I've translated that. Hmm. Oh. Or they can now have fun singing together. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like the dialogue itself. Oh, this is a. Uh, oh, let's take a break and get a good cup of coffee or something to drink. Demasius, right? How about seven point.